Sean, it's been a week, and it's only Thursday. There's a lot of news going on in the National Hockey League this week. A lot of fun stuff that we're going to break down here on this podcast, but I got to see Patrick Kane wearing a Detroit Red Wings uniform, practice uniform, but a uniform nonetheless at Madison Square Garden. And I got to tell you, that was interesting. I bet it was. It's kind of hard to imagine. But before we get into that, I thought you were trying to be like the cool kids with it's been a week, kind of like it's been a minute. Um, but you're not that I'm not cool, cool. So yeah, no. you didn't really you didn't really pull it off. But it was a good try, if even if it was unintentional. But you know who is cool? It's Patrick Kane. And he's back. Personally a little shocked that he signed with Detroit. Um, but you know, he talked to a lot of teams and, and I think he thought that Detroit was the best fit, right? You would you would know a little better. You spoke to him after practice. Nick spoke to him the day, uh, or Nick spoke to teammates. Nick Kostanika spoke to teammates the day before he signed. Um, you know, I, I think when he looked at everything, it ended up being the perfect fit. Well, that's kind of what he said. And, and yeah, I got to see him at the morning skate for the Red Wings at Madison Square Garden yesterday, which be, would be Wednesday before they played. He did not play, and he won't play against his other former team, the Chicago Blackhawks, tonight, Thursday night. Uh, before, by the way, we get into this whole thing with Kane, because I think there's a lot to break down. Uh, Thomas Hickey, uh, a new voice for the NHL Network and for MSG Network doing the Islanders. He's going to be joining us in a little bit live from Secaucus. Well, live to us from Secaucus, uh, where the NHL Network studio is. So Thomas Hickey will be joining us. Uh, his first time on the podcast, Sean, and I'm excited to get him on and we'll talk a little, maybe a little Patrick Kane with him, but a little Islanders, maybe a little Connor McDavid, a little defenseman going on. So that's going to be coming up shortly, but back to Kane. So that's, listen, I am surprised too. I didn't see the Detroit Red Wings being the team that he would choose. And it's not a knock on the Detroit Red Wings, but if you're going to sign a one-year contract and you're Patrick Kane, I was thinking more along the lines of a team that you think would be there are no sure things, but maybe more of a sure thing, whereas the Detroit Red Wings are off to a good start, uh, you know, in the first quarter of the season, but they have a lot to prove. That's why I kept thinking of Florida would be the team, and I, I, was, I know I wasn't alone in that thought process. So Florida was a team that was mentioned, but it's a one-year deal. It's $2.75 million, and when you really break it down, the Red Wings have a veteran presence. They have Alex Dabrinkit. Kane knows him obviously quite well. They had the cap space. He eventually decided he wanted a one-year contract to see how this would all play out. He's coming off of major hip surgery on his right hip, hip resurfacing surgery, and it's not a surgery. And even Kane admitted this. It's not proven for guys to come back from this and be the same player they were before this surgery. So there's a lot here. I was surprised it was the Red Wings, but what he said was as he was going through his rehab process and and really in the last month or two paying attention to teams and seeing who might be interested, he it kept coming back to Detroit. He kept calling his agent, Pat Brisson, and asking like, hey, did Detroit call today? What, are, they, are they interested? It, there was something about the Red Wings, the wing wheel, playing for Detroit, another original six team with Debrinket, the style of play that they play, uh, and that ability to what he believes is going to be a seamless fit when he when he joins the lineup likely next week, it kept coming back to the Red Wings. They had the cap space. They had the room on their roster to be able to do it. So in that sense, it looks like a fit. And now he's got to go out and prove something that really hasn't, as he said, been proven yet, Sean. Yeah, no, he does. And but I, I think if you look at it like, look, Nick Backstrom tried to do it. He struggled. He's taken some time off now. Um obviously related to the hip again you know but i think if you look at a guy and you're like can i can somebody do it right it's patrick kane he's a rink rat he's been in the rink ever since he's had the surgery you know he he talked about you know testing it um one-on-one two-on-two five-on-five and and just feeling like he has two legs again which is kind of scary right when you think about patrick kane and, and and what he's done in the past couple of years and he's done all that on one leg so if somehow he figures out how to do this and he's been able to rehab the muscles around that hip and and everything else like he could be really dangerous and there's precedent for this right nick nick kostanika wrote a great column yesterday the man who signed him steve eiserman had radical knee surgery 
to continue playing the game and ended up playing for three more years, winning a Masterton trophy, you know, being very successful for Detroit. So Steve Eisman knows what lays ahead, what lies ahead for Patrick Kane. He believes in him clearly, you know, he's seen what he was able to do 20 odd years ago. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of risk taking here, but if you're going to take risks, you take them with Patrick Kane. But it's interesting. It's, it's, it is a risk, no question about it, but, the gamble isn't great here. At the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, it's $2.75 million prorated. That's what it is. There's no long-term commitment here from the Red Wings or Patrick Kane to the Red Wings. They have to see how this works out. It was interesting you know, to hear Derek Lalonde, the Red Wings coach, talk about patience and, and being very you know, conscientious of that patience and, and you know, understanding that the 60 to 65 skates that Patrick Kane has gone through. He rented a house, by the way, for the last four months in Toronto. Uh, and he was skating in Toronto and at various different rinks. And like you said, it was it started off with just skating, getting on two feet, went to some one-on-one battle drills with a former NHL player, Cody Golubuff. It went to three-on-three. It went to five-on-five. Of the 60 to 65 skates that he's had, since he's been rehabbing, he said in the last month, month and a half, two months in that neighborhood, he's been taking contact. So he's not coming to the Detroit Red Wings needing weeks and and questioning if the hip can can handle it. He has battled in contact drills. He said he's the the ability to cross over left over right is back. That wasn't there anymore. He said he was kind of standing straight legged. The guy had fifty plus points between the Blackhawks and the Rangers. On one leg. So if he can feel pretty good, close to 100%, heck, 85%, 90%, he's going to help the Detroit Red Wings. It's a matter of the you know the ability to continue to withstand it and the grind and the rigors of it through the course of the next three quarters of the season and, and if you're the Detroit Red Wings, hopefully the playoffs too. That's going to be the test. It's not going to be the early parts of it. It's going to be how does that hip hold up in March, you know, like what's that looking like now? Kane's a type of player. He's very shifty. He doesn't get hit very often, but that shiftiness requires, you know, muscles in your hip to be able to do that. So if that's what I'm going to be watching, I, I obviously I want to see him debut. I think, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be shocked if it was against Buffalo on Tuesday. If it's not there, it'll be Thursday at home at little Caesars arena against the San Jose sharks. He's probably going to play with the brinket. If Dylan Larkin's back in the lineup, he's going to be with him too. He's going to be put in a position to succeed, and Lalonde talked about that. He's going to be on their power play. Let's see Patrick Kane get going. If he can get back to Patrick Kane, who was the way he was at 32, 31 years old, instead of now being, now being 35, why the Red Wings added a real dangerous asset. And it is going to be contact, right? Like Patrick Kane can whistle by the graveyard all he wants and say, oh, I've taken contact. Cody Golubov and and players like that are not lining Patrick Kane up and saying, oh, you want to test your hip? I'm going to test your hip. Right. Now there's going to be guys saying, you want to test your hip? I'll test your hip for you. You know, there's going to be Darlene. There's going to be whoever it is, right? It's going to be like, oh, you're in the corner. Let's see how good that hip is over and over again. And so you're right. It's going to be the wear and tear. You know, it, it, Nick Backstrom, when he came back, thought he was good to go. And then he got to a point where he's like, I'm not, I need more rest. I need to figure out whether I can do this or not. So, uh, you know, nobody wants to pour water on the fire, on a building fire here, the excitement that's going on, but it will be a long-term process. And, and look, if anybody has a sense of theater, he plays in his hometown against the Sabres. Oh, yeah as his triumphant return maybe if you're detroit you try and convince him to wait two nights later to play at little caesars against the sharks who are one of the bottom teams in the league and you also dictate who he plays against at that point with last change but i don't know if you're talking patrick kane out of playing in buffalo yeah i don't know about that you know I, that'll be interesting no question about it but you know what's interesting too this is uh it's reminiscent to me of what happened last year when he went to the rangers Part of the reason was Panarin, right? Well, part of the reason he wants to go to the Red Wings here is to bring it. Well, that chemistry did not come back with Panarin. Now, it was longer. It had been longer time apart than it was, than it was between Kane and Debrinkit, but it didn't return. So you can't just bank on it coming back. He, he's This isn't something where he's just going to be stepping into this familiar place and everything's going to be right. Like 
He's going to have to work for it uh, to, to have it come back. And Dabrinka talked about that, too. He goes, I, I, we think the game alike. I know where to go on the ice. He knows where to move the puck on the ice. That's why it works. We mesh well together. But even Dabrinka told me it, it might not come back right away. The beauty of it, though, is he's going to debut in early December and get that run-up time with Dabrinka to get it to make it work. He didn't have the time, really, with Artemi Panarin, and he was playing on one hip. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. Like, it never came back with Panarin because Kane wasn't the same player. He couldn't right. do the things that he had done the first time around with Panarin. Um, so, you know, again, there's a lot that we need to see out there, but there's no question that this is one of the best stories of the first half of the NHL season. Sean, another big news story this week is John Hines taking over as the new coach of the Minnesota Wild, former NHL.com staff writer, John Hines, of course, used to do the coach's room with us, got two articles in. I didn't think he was going to get a lot of articles in. I thought this guy would get a job in Minnesota. Not surprised at all. The wildfire, Dean Evason, 5 and 2 in their last seven, you know, just underachieving in all areas of the game. Bill Guerin has a ton of history with John Hines. Uh, so we lose a staff writer in the Minnesota Wild, gain a coach. You know, Dan, I'm not a gambling guy, but if I were, I would just bet on whoever does the coach's room being the next person hired in the NHL. The track record that we have with the coach's room, we've gotten everybody that's ever done it a job by the next season. So, And we've already lost Dallas Eakins this year. He went to Germany. Now we lose John Hines. So any coaches out there that want a job, reach out to Dan Rosen. He'll hook you up. It is clearly all us. It has nothing to do with their coaching ability. Listen, I I wasn't, as I said, I mean, I, I wasn't surprised. I, Dean Evason was a good coach for the Minnesota Wild for a long time. Uh, Mike Russo in The Athletic sat down with him, did a really good story on him. He doesn't have any regrets about, um, you know, what went on there and said he didn't see it coming. I'm kind of, I don't know how he didn't see it coming. I mean, they were underachieving. They were giving up almost four goals per game. The penalty kill was a was around 66, 67 percent. Those are coach killers. It's an absolute coach killer. It's a team in the middle, and they were now in the bottom. They were they were supposed to be middle towards top. They are now bottom, and Hines has to coach them out of it. But listen, this is what nearly fifteen million dollars in dead cap space will do sometimes, and that's what they have. And they knew it when they bought out Ryan Suter and Zach Parisi. They knew what was coming. But they didn't know that the defensive structure would fall apart. They didn't know that the penalty kill would fall apart. They didn't know that Philip Gustafson and Marc Andre Fleury would struggle the way they did. They were built. They built their success to be a playoff team last season on strong defense and excellent goaltending, and they were getting neither one of those things this season. And that's why John Hines is now coaching the Minnesota Wild. I'm so tired of the 15 million dollar cap narrative. But it's a this fact. Is, this is not an unskilled Two good team. players. So? It, it, what? All the things that you just explained have nothing to do with skill. They have to do with will. Penalty yes. killing is not skill. Penalty, penalty killing is will. Clearing out the front of your net is not skill. It's will. Winning puck battles on the boards is not skill. It's will. There was no will. You could have $80 million to spend. And you can't buy Will. I'm not going to disagree with you. I think you're 100% right. And that's why I brought up those things. They didn't expect those things to fall apart. To me, that's just a lazy narrative. But if you take $15 million off of your cap, you're taking off the potential of having two very good players. They knew what they were doing. You can't take it back. And Ryan Suter and Zach Parisi are not $15 million worth of players right now. So I don't blame them, to be honest with you, either. Because once it was either going to be Suter and Parisi or nobody. They chose nobody for that money. And that's okay. But it's good. you don't have a number one center. You don't have a number one defenseman. Those guys make up for some of those differences. Those guys bring some will. They'll skill their way sometimes. So when the will breaks down a little bit, you outscore it. Right, they can't do that right now. And on top of that, their best player, Kirill Kaprizov, well, he doesn't look like he did last season. 
right? I mean, where, where he was just great last season. Maybe he's hurt. I don't know. Maybe it's the cast around him. I'm not sure. But I'll tell you what. John Hines came in, and he coached them against the St. Louis Blues on Tuesday night. And they looked good. The PK looked good. The goaltending was solid. They scored. Matt Boldy broke like a 14-game goalless drought. They win the game 3-1. to one. They get the bump, right? They, we see it all the time, right? The, the, the new coach bump, right? Maybe the Edmonton Oilers are going through it right now. The new coach bump. Hines is a good coach. He coached well with the Nashville Predators. They didn't give up on him when, before he was fired after last season. He won a lot of games there. He made the playoffs. The Wild still think that they can be that, and if that will, Sean, returns, they'll get a lot closer. But it's still, you need some skill too, man. There's there's a few teams in this league that are pay, playing 10, 12, 14 million under the cap that are pretty good. Not many. Like, you can do it. Like it, it, You just need the players that you have to play to their ability. You talked about Matt Boldy. He was a shell of himself. He is a shell of himself. Right. Like these are players that need to step up. And, and that's you know, when you bring in a new coach, you hope that the hand grenade goes off in the room. Right. Oh, my God. I have a new coach. It's a clean slate. And that goes two ways. Right. Like Dean had his guys that he liked. We all have our guys that we like. Right. And they can't do any wrong or they do less wrong. Right. You, you have a path with them and you're like, I know what this guy can do and I'm going to keep riding him. Mm-hmm. John Hines has loyalty to nobody. Everybody has to earn their way again. And and that can be refreshing to players who have become comfortable. And he's a coach that will demand will. I, I think Dean was too, but I just think it got to a point where the players weren't as concerned with the ramifications. Right. I, I do think the one thing that happens with a hamstrung cap roster is you don't have a hammer. There's no hammer for the coach to say, you're going to go sit. I'm done mm-hmm. with you. Because now you play with too few players. Yeah. Like there's there, there's no ability to have that roster flux where you could say, I don't like what you're doing. Go sit. You know, Columbus has done it with all their star players this year to try and get that will back in their game. They didn't bench Patrick Line because he doesn't have any skill. They didn't bench Gaudreau because he doesn't have any skill. They benched him because they weren't showing any will. Yeah. Well, it's also has it doesn't help. And, and you can't pin it on just one position, but it doesn't help that Philip Gustafson and Mark Andre Fleury, who might have been erasing some of the issues last season with the way they played, just have not been good. They flat out have not been the way that they that playing to their own expectations and the Wilds' expectations. And and it's not like the Wild and Billy Garen and Dean Evison didn't try things. I mean, you had Evison meetings, you know, yelling. You know, I don't know the bag skates happen anymore, but. You know, so you know, hard talks, uh, changing lines, ben, you know, trying to to move guys around in the roster. You, you had Billy Garen go in and talk to the team and basically come out and say, this is unacceptable. They're, they exhausted all their options. And, and now you have John Hines there. And listen, uh, having worked with Hines, uh, listen, I got to know him, obviously, when he was coaching the New Jersey Devils through the Nashville Predators. And just the brief time that I worked with him, doing his coaches, you know, helping him out with his coaches' rooms articles. This guy knows the game. He's been following it. He knows exactly what he's walking into. He also has done this before, walking into a team midseason and trying to get that team a bump. He's done it before, and that's what the Minnesota Wild have to see. But you mentioned, like, Matt Boldy, right? He's 22 years old. It's a lot on him. You got other guys here who got to step up to. It's... Let's see if they can do it, Sean, because at the beginning of this season, I think a lot of us had the Minnesota Wild third in that division behind Dallas and Colorado with the same team that they have right now. The Winnipeg Jets are playing well, so you got to give them credit. But are the Minnesota Wild going to be good enough at the end? I don't know if they have enough to be good enough at the end. Well, they certainly have dug themselves a hole. And and the one thing I liked about the game that they played against St. Louis, and you wonder if it's sustainable, is when you watched it back, it was like watching a Minnesota Wild film at one and a half speed, right? From mm-hmm. what you watched all year, you're, you're like, yeah, this team's noticeably faster. They're they're moving the puck faster. They're thinking faster. They were on Red Bull. So maybe you just give them Red Bull for the rest of the year and see what happens. But that's what it looked like. It looked like they had taken some sort of caffeine hit and and were going at a speed that they rarely saw this year. 
And they played with the lead. That helps too. Well, listen, we touched on Patrick Kane. We touched on John Hines. There's obviously a lot going on in the National Hockey League, and we hit on a lot of it with Thomas Hickey. He is our guest, NHL Network and MSG Network covering the Islanders as well. Here's our interview with Thomas Hickey. Thomas, thanks for joining us. And just before we hit record here, we were talking a little bit about the Islanders, a team you're very familiar with. You played your whole career there. You, you do a lot of stuff on MSG Network with them. What's going on with the Islanders right now? It seems like a very un-Islander-like season. Yeah, you, you touched on it. Like I, I think when everyone thinks of the New York Islanders, especially over the last decade, but at least the last five years, like the fundamental things would be a disciplined hockey team that kills penalties well. And if they've got a lead, even if it's one goal or two in the third period, it's as good as a win. You know, you score that first goal often. It's like that could be enough. Um, it hasn't been that same group this year. It's it's really strange and really uncharacteristic, like the amount of uh, stick infractions, not just when they take penalties, uh, not just the penalties themselves. It's like the time of the game that they take them, uh, you know, like the other night in New Jersey, uh, up four, three have a power play and about 30 seconds later they're killing off a four on three um and they didn't end up killing it off the the penalty kill in the third period it's it's been so strange to see and, it, and it's tough to watch because you know that there's so many guys that are capable of it not just because you think they're good players but they've shown that they are in the past um it, it's been a really tough season and, and holding a lead's been their biggest issue all season long. And uh, they had a couple wins in a row where they held on to third period leads and you thought maybe they were over it, but, but gave up a two goal uh, third period lead and end up losing in regulation their last game. Um, and as bad as things have been, uh, it's a group that if you look at the standings, um, especially in the Metro right now, like everyone seems to be alive just with um, yeah, how tough it is for everyone to come up with points in the Metro uh, teams are still sort of figuring themselves out. So it's been a strange year for the Islanders. I know there's optimism in that room that uh, they played with the lead so much this year. That, that's got to say something good about it, but I, I think there needs to be some adjustments made for sure, because the way that they're playing, it's just not sustainable to go through a whole season like that and expect to be a playoff team. The other part that's been unusual is they score a ton compared to what they've done in the past. They scored four against the Devils. You're like, that's enough to win. And regularly, they've they've outscored what I think we've expected them to do and still haven't put together a, a big winning streak, even with that offensive production. Yeah, especially lately. Like, the goals have been coming. Uh, you're not used to seeing the Islanders in 5-4 hockey games. It's usually the 2-1 or the 3-2. Um, you know, I, I think about a month ago, scoring was an issue. Uh, they were down there with, with the bottom – bottom teams in the league, but the power play started to click and all of a sudden a power play that over the last month has been fantastic. Uh, and they're getting goals every single game. And sometimes it's only one opportunity and they're able to get one. I, I think the big difference this year is, uh, you know, last year Pierre Engvall came in and really found chemistry with, uh, with Kyle Palmieri and Brock Nelson. And they've been a really consistent line where they, they're always generating, they're out really on the bad side of it. Some nights they'll walk away with two or three goals, and the other nights they're they're holding their own and they're really good. And, and then this year you've got Matt Barzell and Bo Horvat that have a full season together. And those two guys, uh, when they're on, and all of a sudden you got a top six that can sort of come at you uh, line after line and, and and some good depth throughout the lineup, they, they've been finding that. So, uh, like I said, it, it's uncharacteristic. Yeah, they've been scoring goals and still losing, um, which is strange. And I, I don't really think it's a matter of – uh, deciding to score and, and sacrificing so much defensively, like all season long, they've been giving up quite a bit, but with that power play going, that's an element that I think they're going to rely on because, um, you know, not, not the quickest group compared to a lot of teams that they play against. So they're going to rely on those special teams and, and keeping that production from their top guys. But uh, it, it has been encouraging to see that, that they're scoring goals at least uh, while they, while they try to sort everything else out. Well, the Edmonton Oilers are starting to score some goals too. So to switch gears to them, Connor McDavid is obviously on. Yeah, I mean he's hot. He he's on fire again. He's got twelve points in the last three games as we talk right now. Uh, two goals, ten assists. The Oilers have won the three games. It's funny when people say, "Well, McDavid's back," like he went anywhere, right? I mean, he's just was human for a little bit. But is there like when you do you? Did you expect this? Did you expect at some point? And I think we kind of did, right? Like. 
the Oilers to just get hot at a moment and reel off a bunch of goals, McDavid to rip, rip off a bunch of points and a market correction, if you will. Did you, did you kind of expect that? Yeah, I think I've been expecting it for about a month, right? And it took time to happen. Um, it was strange this year. Like the Islanders were at Edmonton uh, a few weeks back, and that was right after the coaching change for Edmonton. And it was the first time that I've ever seen Connor McDavid fit in into a hockey game and not stand out. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no question in my mind he was battling something as he continues to get it back. And it took a few more games, and all of a sudden – he's taken off and I'm not surprised by that one bit. I, I still think that that team's going to make the playoffs. Um, obviously like the Islanders, they're, they're a work in progress. You, you, all of a sudden you start pressing and, and other issues flare up and, and rear their heads and they've had a lot to contend with, but I'm not surprised to see him back on the top of his game. I think he's the best player on the planet and uh, 12 points in the last three games. I mean, that's, it's a fairly average week for him over the last couple of years. And that's hard to say uh, about anyone else in the game, but I'm happy to see him healthy. The game is better when Connor McDavid's at his best. And, you know, I, I just look at him addressing the media, talking all the time, like he's carrying a lot on his shoulders and it just goes to show if, if they're going to get hot, he's the main piece behind that with Dreisaitl and, and good on him for finding a way. Cause uh, not only with how, for the the mood and the energy has been at Edmonton this year, but he certainly wasn't feeling his best coming back from injury early. And I'm, I'm just happy for him and for the game that, uh, that he looks like himself once again. And it, it looks just like those two guys will will this group into the playoffs. I'm curious as a player and having gone through it, when, when a player like Connor McDavid, any star player is struggling and there's the psychological impact that comes with that, how much of that permeates into a team, right? How much of what was happening to Edmonton was a reflection of the fact that Connor was struggling and, and he wasn't feeling good. And it was obvious, right? It was, it was tangible. I was there for the heritage classic. You could, you could sense it coming off of him. Like how much does that permeate into a team? Uh, I, I think it speaks to his importance at Edmonton. Like I, I know he's a superstar. We talk about how great he is, but he's like, it just shows the importance of him to that franchise and what it's like when he's not at the very top of his game. And that's a burden to carry. And he does it so well. Uh, I mean, I think on the opposition side, when you're playing against guys that are really struggling, you know how good they are. Um, there, there's been times like that in my career where you're playing someone that extremely high pedigree, you know, they're a superstar and things aren't going good, you just you just don't poke that guy. You, you, you know, you don't poke the bear, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I don't think you do anything to give them extra motivation. You don't take extra shots behind the whistle between plays. Uh, you, you just let them be and figure it out. And as a player, you hope that you're playing those guys on their off nights because that's a much better chance at, at winning the hockey game if, if these superstars are are going through these little stretches that everybody goes through. Here's what I can't get past, though, is the is the fact of like it's taken this type of hot streak from Connor McDavid for the Oilers to to get right, if you will. It, yeah, he's not he's a he's an unreal player. He's not going to score 12 points every three games. Right. I mean, it's it can't it can't just be McDavid and dry settle, in my opinion, for the depth that they are already in, like where how far they have to climb. They're going to need a heck of a lot more, don't you think? Yeah, they will. And like you, you just got to hold your breath and hope those two guys can stay healthy all season. But th there's no question. We, we've talked about it all along for, for years now as the Oilers have really built around these two guys. You you need more pieces. Bottom line, we, we've seen it that two guys aren't enough to win a Stanley Cup. I think these guys are doing everything within their power, but you, you're going to need to find that defensive structure that has probably been missing um in Edmonton and and looked like it got figured out near playoff time the last couple of seasons and only to come up just a little bit short but uh absolutely like you, the, you need quality minutes out of your third and fourth line without question if if you're going to buy these guys a little bit of breathing room and buy them enough room to you know maybe only put up three points in three games or something like that absolutely it's it's got to come from somewhere else and I think that's been the the question floating around Edmonton for a long time and I think you know, the Matias Ekholm move, that was that was to address things like this. And, you know, I think they're putting together the pieces, but obviously it's it's difficult in the salary cap world to to find all the right people to fill those spots. And, you know, I, I think for them, as they get through this, um, they're hoping that they come out the other side with this group of guys that, that they thought at the start of the year was 
the answer to it. So I, I think time's going to tell us what the answer is to that. It's been such a weird season. We didn't have any questions about Edmonton going into it. Most people picked them to be Stanley Cup finalists. Um, there were a lot of questions about the Nashville Predators, and maybe they're still out there, but probably the hottest team in the league right now. And and they they play Minnesota tonight, who's one of the coldest teams in the league, and switch coaches. But when when you look at Ed, when you look at Nashville, what do you see that's allowed them without a ton of star power? They moved a lot of it to kind of rebuild to to be such a successful team during this stretch. Yeah, I, I think it's bringing in the pieces that they did. Like you bring in a Ryan O'Reilly, um, to, that's like that does a lot to your dressing room. Obviously, the reputation that he carries, but you know, I, I think it's the influx of the veteran guys they brought in, and then all of a sudden, uh, you look at that group last year down the stretch that no one believed in, and you had a bunch of guys go out and prove to themselves and to management. Uh, and ownership that they're NHL players. Like I, I wrote that team off from uh, probably March last year on, and they just wouldn't go away. I think those guys learned a lot about themselves and really showed some character and showed that that they've got game and ability. And and all of a sudden you mix that with the veteran pieces, and and it does make sense. The other point I would make, like uh, I I was remiss to to write Spencer Carberry off early, it, not him, but the Washington Capitals because out of the gates, they didn't look very good one bit. Uh, and I thought, you know, this the, the group, the makeup just isn't there. With a new coach like Andrew Burnett is in uh, in Nashville, just as Carberry is in Washington, it takes a few weeks, uh, if not a month or two, to, to really tell these guys what you expect from them and explain it to them and have examples. And uh, and I think that's probably a big reason why too, you, you don't just come in and implement everything you're thinking as a, as a head coach right away. It, it takes time. It's trial and error. It's, it's showing what you did right and what you did wrong. And you need enough of a sample size. And perhaps that's another reason why uh, that Nashville's coming around too, is, is just a little more time for Andrew Burnett to get his, to get his DNA and, and fingerprints on that group and and show them how they, are expected to be playing. I'm glad you brought that up because that is one of those things that gets unsaid, basically. You know, a team with, that believes in itself, the Predators believe in themselves. They're not a rebuilding team. They might be in the middle, but they're not a rebuilding team. And they don't get off to the start that they want to get off to. They don't, they, they have to also, players themselves, don't they, right? You guys have to understand it does take some time. How do you kind of balance that? You know, if you're a player in that situation, how hard is that to balance? Like, I'm a I'm a veteran guy. I know my time is limited. I feel I'm on a good team. I like my coach. It's not working. But I know if we pay, if we if we wait a little bit here and we ride it out, it'll work. But at the same time, you know, time's passing us by here, and we don't have a lot of time to make it up either. How do you balance no, you all that? You're, you're absolutely right. I, it's so much easier as a player, to be honest with you. And I, and I know that's probably not the answer you'd expected, but, um, you know, now that I'm on the other side of it and I'm analyzing a group, um, it, it, and it's the most cliche thing ever, but when you play the game, hockey's a day-to-day thing. It's, it's what's tomorrow, it's practice, or it's a game. Let's get prepared for that. And you don't really get caught up in the big picture as much as you do uh, being in my position now where mm-hmm. – it's always our tendency to analyze and then overanalyze and overthink as a player. You don't have that option. Uh, you just, you just play the game and you do your best and you believe in what you're doing. Um, and if you believe the people above you that they've put everyone in the right place, then just do your job and things will fall into place. And the teams that are built the right way, uh, find a way to get through those stretches. But I think as a player, it's a little bit easier because you just, you just focus on yourself. You're not worried about, um, a big team picture all the time. You're just making sure you do the, the best job. And I know that sounds so cliche, but I truly do believe that. Thomas, last one before we let you go here. I'm curious, you talked about being an analyst now and watching the game differently. And it obviously it is different as a player. You're not looking at matchups or tendencies or stuff like that. I'm curious if there's a couple of defensemen, because obviously that's your specialty that you've been watching and have jumped off the page for you that maybe the casual fan doesn't know much about. Yeah, I mean... Uh... I, I think these guys are so good, like Makar and Hughes, and I know the casual fan would say, obviously, I see it too. You you don't need to know hockey to watch these two guys play and look at how incredible they are. Um, you know, but I, I think it's like a new wave of defensemen in the NHL that's just as dynamic as 
as your superstar forwards that um, have an ability on the offensive blue line to not just beat guys, but to make people look bad. I, I think you see it so often with maybe a skilled player coming in off of the rush and it looks like everyone backs off of them uh, and gives them way too much time and space because there's a respect factor there. I think the way the game's changing, if you can be dynamic as these guys on the offensive blue line, um, it, it changes the whole game. You get more space and people are scared to to get beat straight up because you find you put your teammates in a really vulnerable position. So I, I know that that wouldn't be something that would uh, those two players wouldn't stand out to everyone in the sense that people don't know they're good, but what they're doing in the offensive blue line, I, I think uh, that's what blows me away the most. Yeah, well, and their numbers are ridiculous yeah. to yeah. to date. <laughs> hey, man, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, good luck on the show, NHL Network, NHL Now tonight, and NHL Network and MSG Network all the time. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me on. Great stuff there with Thomas Hickey. Glad we were able to get him on a newcomer to the podcast, Sean. He will be back. He was pretty good. Uh, listen, if we're he at chooses quarter... to be. If he chooses to be. I would hope that he does. We were very kind, I think. I was. I know that. Um, listen, we're at the quarter mark of the season, or we're past the quarter mark of the season. When was it exactly? You know this. You have the math. It was the third game Tuesday night. See, he knows this. Third game Tuesday night. All right. So we are past the quarter mark of the season, but we did something on NHL.com surprises uh, through the quarter mark of the season. We do our trophy trackers as well. A lot of things to celebrate 25% of the way through. My big surprise, Sean, was the Wild, who who we talked about already. Just the, the struggles that they've gone through, the fact that they've needed a coaching change. That was my big surprise. Uh, what's your big surprise for the start of the season? Well, in that article, it was Frank, Frank Vitrano in Anaheim. Mm-hmm. He's top 10 Frank goal the tank. scoring. Frank the Tank. Same number of goals as Sidney Crosby. And he's on pace, I think, for 52 goals. Now, that's not going <laughs> to happen, but kids never scored more than 24, right? And he was a huge part of what was a really good start for Anaheim that's kind of lost some of its luster, but he has not stopped. Um, and I love, like, these first quarter – guys that you just see you look at this at, at whatever stat it is and you're like what is that guy doing there um and it's awesome right good for him mm-hmm. nine years in the league four teams like enjoy your time in the spotlight but to me and it was already taken mike morial did uh cam talbot and you know playing for the kings to me the biggest surprise of the first quarter is the los angeles kings i thought they were going to be a good team i didn't think they were going to be this good i have them number one and our Super 16. I know I'm in the minority, actually, with you and Tom Glitty, and seeing we're the three smartest people that work for NHL.com, maybe more people will have them next week. Well, I agree with you on that 100%. That is, we will never disagree on that because you lumped me into the category as well. The Kings aren't a surprise for me. Talbot is. Um, but the King, I thought the Kings were going to be a very good team this season. I thought, I thought that they would be top three in the division. They will be. Uh, Maybe they're better than I thought they were going to be. Talbot is a huge reason why. But I actually, it was interesting. I actually had a conversation with Jonathan Quick just the other day at Rangers practice about the way the Kings play now under Todd McClellan with the, the experience and the talent that they have. At the end of John Quick's tenure there, um, his numbers don't look great. Well, there was times where it was a little bit all over the place as they were learning to play that style. We just heard, you know, Thomas Hickey talking about the fact of, you know, it takes guys some time to learn how to play the system the way the way guys want to play. And there were times where it was a little bit all over the place and Quick's game was a little bit all over the place. You're the first to admit that, that his game was, you know, up and down and up and down. But the way they play now, it's, and this is to take absolutely nothing away from Talbot, who's been terrific it's really tailor-made for goaltenders. And it's the same way as Vegas Golden Knights when they're on their game, right? It's tailor-made for goaltenders. They're not asking the goalie to make 10 bell saves all the time. Quick in his prime would do that because he played so far out and he would challenge the shooter and he knew the defenseman had the pass and that was the system, right? But they're not asking Talbot to be outstanding 
all the time. Just like the Vegas Golden Knights don't ask Aiden Hill or their goaltender to be outstanding all the time. They play so structured and so well in front of the goalie that they ask the goalie to do his job. And Talbot's done his job as well or better than almost every goalie in the league this season. So good on him, right? I mean, that's it. You, you're that you're supposed to do his job. But the Kings' style and their system, it leads itself to cutting down on goals against. And what may be more surprising than anything else is how much they're driving offense this season. Look, tomorrow is December 1st. The Kings haven't lost on the road yet. <laughs> It's amazing. You know how hard that is to do in the NHL? And that speaks to how good a team they are. And that was the tiebreaker for me to put them at number one. When you can go on the road and you can win your first nine games, you're a special team because you're you're not dictating the matchups. You know, you're not doing any of that. And then you look and people are going to say, well, they lost last night to the Washington Capitals. Well, if you didn't stay up and well, watch that game and you're like, they lost to Washington Capitals. Do you know how many faceoffs there were? in the Washington Capitals end yeah. in the third period of that game? I don't know the number. I didn't get a chance to watch a lot of it. I watched a lot of it on uh, – I watched some of it on, actually, NHL Network earlier today because I wanted to see it. They dominated the game, though. One face-off. Yeah. In, One in the face-off Caps in, the, in, the, in, 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 in the Kings' DM. No, in the Kings, in the Kings end, in the attacking yeah. – in the Washington attacking end, there was one face-off. What were the Kings doing so well when they won the Cups those, you know, almost, you know, a decade ago? They were in control of yeah. every game. They were in control. They had the puck. They were dominant with the puck. This team is that way right now. Listen, I, another thing that we got to mention with the Kings is Quinton Byfield. And I answered a question about him in my mailbag this week. The play of Quinton by the question was a little. I found I liked the question, but it was a little bit ridiculous. Is Quinton Byfield turning Anze Kopitar into a 40 goal scorer? I mean, Kopitar is a Hall of Fame player. He has something to do with this, okay? The fact that he is, you know, on pace for 40 this season and he's never touched 40 in his career. Byfield, though, go watch the goals that Kopitar has scored where Byfield's had an impact, and there's about five or six of them that he's had a direct impact on. Big body, on the wall, you know, creating turnovers, using his big body to do that, then using his skill they moved this guy from center to wing. They put him on a line with Andre Kopitar. And again, another situation where it doesn't just click for guys when they come into the league. He It's clicking for him right now. Same way it's clicking for Alexi Lafreniere with the New York Rangers. You're playing with an elite player. And Lafreniere's uh, playing with Panarin. Byfield's playing on the wing with Kopitar and Adrian Kempe. And you're able to play your game and do what you do, and you have an understanding of the league. Byfield looks terrific. He's a huge factor in why the Kings are where they are. You know the other reason, and this is another reason why the Kings are so good that that Kopitar is scoring the way he is, because he's not the guy anymore. They have three guys, yeah, up the middle. You want to shut a player down? You don't have to tap Anze Kopitar on the shoulder and say, "Go shut him down." They got two other guys that can do that. So now he draws some matchups where he's the dominant offensive guy, right? He's being asked to go play offense instead of shutting another guy down. You're going to score a few more goals that way. So their depth down the middle rivals any team in the league. And to me, that's the most important thing. And, you know, they built it that way because they played the the Oilers the last two years in the playoffs. And what do you need mm -hmm. to play the Oilers? You need to be deep down the middle. Yeah. McDavid and Dreisaitl. And I think they're there, and now they have the complementary pieces. So they've been one of the biggest surprises in the first quarter of the season. I think a lot of those surprises are going to wane. I, like I said, I don't think Frank Vertrano is going to score 52 goals. I hope he does. Good mass boy. I hope he scores 50, but I'm not putting any money on that. I, I, would, I would certainly – be willing to say that the Los Angeles Kings, you said they were going to be a good team. They're an elite team right now. They're they're among the teams that are battling for the President's Trophy. And nobody thought that was going to happen because everybody picked their rival, the Oilers, to win the Cup. Yeah. So they weren't even going to win the division. But there they are. They're right there. And, and to me, they've been one of the real feel-good stories of the first quarter of the season. And, and Todd McClellan should get more votes for Coach of the Year. He won't. 
because it's West Coast and nobody pays attention and they've been good for years. I'm not talking about us, Dan. I'm talking about like, in Rick general. Rick Tockett was our guy for coach of the year. He's yeah, in Vancouver. No. <laughs> well, but it's also a big headline, right? The yeah. coach of the year is always the guy that's taken a team from nowhere to the top. It's never the guy yes. who consistently ices a, a, a really good team with maybe not the best talent. So I, I think he should be acknowledged more for the job he's done coaching, but a really, really good team that I think has surprised a lot of people in the first quarter of the season. Yeah, McClellan's been building. The Kings have been building. There's a lot of good things going on in the NHL right now. And by next week when we talk, maybe, Sean, we'll have a debut from Patrick Kane to talk about as well with the Detroit Red Wings. And who knows what else is going to transpire. A lot of stuff going on in the league here as we're past Thanksgiving and approaching the Christmas. It's, it's a good time in the NHL to – you know what it is? Once you get past Thanksgiving, Sean, right, like it's all go time now. And I think that's where we're at. And some heads are rolling and some guys are getting hot and teams are becoming who they are. So by next week, Sean, I hope we're talking about the Detroit Red Wings playing with Patrick Kane, too. Yeah, that'll be great. But there'll be storylines anyway. So enjoy this show and tune in next week and we'll see you then.